Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. Okay, so how do you go from, you know, 300 pounds and, you know, feeling disgusting in your life and, you know, thinking, is this all there is to getting lean, getting fit, inspiring millions of people all over the world, writing three New York, New York Times bestsellers, and essentially biohacking not just your own life, but lives of people everywhere. My guest today is going to share exactly how he did that. And I'm so excited to share his wisdom with all of you all over the world. Just a quick announcement. We have UME online coming up September 25th and 26th. So that is the ultimate marketing experience where we're bringing the experts in social media, podcasting, Instagram advertising, YouTube optimization, and our guest today to share with you how to grow and hack your business in your life. So with that, I want to get right into it. So my guest today is the founder and chairman of the Bulletproof brand. And he has, as I mentioned, written three New York Times bestsellers. And I have one of them on my desk right now. I've read all of them. He's been featured in Bloomberg, Business Insider, Forbes, New York Times, Fast Company, Today, Dr. Oz, CNN, the list goes on and on. And in his spare time, he's running three co- or six companies, actually. And he's on a quest to live to 180 years old. So with that, my guest today is the one and only Dave Asprey. Dave, thanks for being here. Hey, Susan. I'm happy to be here. So Dave, you're constantly, I want to jump right in, you're constantly biohacking your life. And I, you know, I've, I've listened to so many of your shows and read your books. And it seems to me that for you, there's just, it's just this constant wanting to improve, wanting to improve. What's lighting your soul on fire these days? It, it's actually more about playing. Uh, I'm like a kid and you see this big control panel and you have to go and push all the buttons and turn the knobs and see if they do right? <laughs> and it just turns out a lot of them aren't labeled yet. So it, it's a matter of just discovery. And to me, that's what just makes me happy. And that's why I can go from Silicon Valley, like how do we make the internet scale? How do we build cloud computing, which is how I, I built my career. And there it was always, how do you do it for bigger, better, faster, cheaper, less work? Uh, and when I started my career, you know, one person could manage five computers. <laughs> And when I was done with that portion of what I do, you can manage 10,000. And frankly, now as many as you want, because we made it all, you know, automated and policy based. And I look at that and I said, okay, what's not managed well here along that time, it's aging, it's, you know, weight loss. And more importantly for me was cognitive function because hitting 300 pounds, okay, that sucks, but it's the brain drain that happens when you carry that extra weight, the energy that should go into thinking and doing and feeling and being, it goes into love handles. And, and that's not good for entrepreneurs in particular. And people in business have a really rough time. It's easy if you're a pro athlete because you're expected to rest and recover. And if you're an athlete, or sorry, if you're an entrepreneur, not an athlete, you just well, go to the next meeting. You know, there's always more work to be done. And so recovery is actually the major skill for business people. And that's why I've been able to, by looking at this with a hacker's mindset, and literally I was VP of cloud security for one of the largest computer security companies in the world before I cut over to Bulletproof. Um, It's how do I manage uh, my energy, my biology? How do I hack those aspects of things? And I can do Bulletproof, which is out there to disrupt big food, you can say, but also my company, TrueDark. You know, my name's actually on the patent for one of our our glasses that are there to improve sleep quality and allow you to, you know, shift your jet lag and all. And why did I do this? Because I knew circadian biology mattered and I couldn't buy glasses because blue blockers don't work the way they're supposed to, especially for jet lag. So I don't have jet lag in my life when I fly to Dubai. Oh, wait, I don't fly anywhere anymore. But when I did fly, (laughs) I just wear them at night before I go to bed because I sleep better. Just with transcendental meditation, that's the only flying that's happening now. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that and mushrooms, right? Apparently exactly. They're legal. Yeah. <laughs> well, in some countries, I don't know. I, uh, I guess fair hard to fair say. point. The, uh, the, the country of Denver has them legal, I think. In the country of Denver. <laughs> yeah, we, well, that's a whole other topic of conversation. The, uh, <laughs> the, in talking about recovery, there was a New York Times article that said, 
sleep is the new wealth in Wall Street. And this was, of course, before the times we're living now. And we're going to talk about sleep in a few minutes. But lately, I've noticed a trend in you know, you're, you're featuring the media almost every single day. You're spending a lot of time talking about sleep. You've hacked sleep. You, you are able to, and you've proven that you can sleep less time than the average person and have a better quality sleep and be more refreshed. Can you talk about that? Um, sure. Let me just, so last night I finished my next book, literally the final edits on the final chapter and it got sent to my publisher this morning, uh, which is really cool, but I might've stayed up late. Now I'm here in my studio. I also do my writing here, but the entire place is outfitted with lights from my same company that makes the glasses, the, the, these are called True Light, that are red. So at night, I can stay up late without disrupting my circadian rhythm. And I wear the glasses, I turn my computer down and all. And I use a ring called Aura to monitor my sleep. So you could say I got really bad sleep last night because, well, I slept four hours and 13 minutes. Okay, that's because I stayed up really late and then I woke up relatively early because I had some stuff to do and I have kids. Well, except here's the deal. My, I don't know if my camera's going to autofocus on this or not. Is it working? Uh, no, come on, camera. It's you blurry. Can do it. Oh, there we no, go. I see it. Yep. So you're like, oh no, it's all red. An hour and 55 minutes of deep sleep. There's a lot of people who slept eight hours last night who didn't get two hours of deep sleep. I only got a half hour of REM sleep. That's expected for a half a night's sleep. I'm not saying this is good for you. I'm saying I just wrote my hopefully fourth New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and... I am not dead today. I'm not a zombie. I am just myself, right? I did not have this capability when I was young. I was a zombie a lot. And it's because, this is going to sound really crazy. Susan, healthy people need less sleep. And healthy and unhealthy people don't know how to sleep. It is a practice, just like you don't know how to meditate when you start. You don't know how to exercise when you start. You don't know how to play chess when you start. It takes practice, awareness, monitoring, and what we would call statistical process control in the, the business world, which basically means you monitor what you're doing and you see what works to make it get better. And if it starts to trend in a negative way, what did I do that's wrong, right? And what you'll find very quickly is any amount of alcohol ruins your sleep quality. You'll still sleep as much, the sleep is just no good. You'll find that eating after dark is really bad for your sleep. You'll find that going in ketosis and staying in ketosis forever is rotten for your sleep, that you have to cycle. That's a big part of my, my first big book, The Bulletproof Diet. People have lost about a million pounds on The Bulletproof Diet uh, at this point, just based on estimates. And it really matters. So how do you know unless you're tracking it? You don't. I'm the weird guy who tracked my sleep for 14 years. I used to sleep with a headband on that would do it. Uh, and Victoria's Secret definitely did not approve that one, uh, thanks to my wife for you know, allowing all that weirdness. And I've had sheets that track my sleep, and now I just use the Aura Ring. I was even C2 of one of the first companies that could get heart rate from the wrist. So you pay attention, and it's a daily practice. And it's funny, people have scales, and they look at their scale every day, and they have no idea whether it's water, fat, or muscle. I have a $26,000 scale that's part of my Upgrade Labs company um, that's open down in LA, where I can actually tell you how much fat, muscle, and water, and bone is in my right leg versus my left leg, because we can get the data. But if you don't look at it, you don't know, hey, maybe I should do some more left-legged squats today, because you can't see it. Now, we're talking with business people. How many people can scale a business if they don't know where they're making money or losing money? What worked, what didn't work? You're going to be buying more ads and you can't see if they work or not? No, you're not. Uh, unless you like billboards, then you just hope they work. So that, that's the perspective I have on human biology too. And I'm also, as a technologist, I'm not going to deploy another server in my N plus one architecture unless I can tell that the servers I have are doing something, right? You have to monitor to have control. And we have this weird idea, oh, we're humans. We have no control, therefore we won't monitor. And monitoring leads to control. Or if you want to be sexy about it, you have to track it to hack it. And that, it's real, it works. I've lost that 100 pounds. My brain response time, which is something you can, you can measure, it reliably goes, down, goes up with time. And as you age, your thinking really is slower. Well, mine is that of a 20-year-old. <laughs> so it's called the P300 measure of responsiveness. 
So I have a fast brain. I don't think I used to have a fast brain. I've always had a smart brain. But the speed of that, it comes from having highly functioning mitochondria and frankly, from having trained my brain using the latest neuroscience techniques. I actually started a company about five years ago with two neuroscientists on staff who we've built our own hardware and software that hooks up to the brain. No, you don't have to stick it inside the brain. Sorry, Elon. Love you, man. Um, I don't think we need to go there yet. Uh, what we can do is we can get a signal off the brain and show the brain what's going on. The, the software, hardware, technology perspective there is why would you replace your hardware when you haven't taken full advantage of the hardware you have? So I'm about how do I essentially use better algorithms in the unconscious parts of my mind to make it more effective. That works too, but you can only do it when you can see what's happening. So just give us visibility in the human body and suddenly you can get younger. The last New York Times book called Superhuman was all about, hey, I'm going to live to at least 180. And people say, Dave, you're crazy. I'm like, fine. Like I'm willing to die trying, <laughs> but I think it's actually possible because I've tracked it, because I've seen my measures get younger instead of older. Like it, it's here, it's real, and it's only getting better exponentially. If it's quantifiable, it's, it's measurable. I love that. And you, it, what a lot of people don't know is um, that, you know, John Gray, Dr. John Gray, he's a mutual acquaintance of ours. Yeah. John has one of the simplest tests for brain function. And I freaking love it. So stand on one foot and close your eyes. If you can get to 60 seconds, you're doing okay. The human brain starts to deteriorate at rapidly at age 35. Um, we lose a lot of fluid in our brains. And as someone who's also hacked her life, like you don't cure yourself of MS, Lyme disease, do an Iron Man with a fractured pelvis, you know, all the weird stuff I do without constantly looking at how do I improve? How yeah. do I improve? Like I wear this watch because, so this is a funny, weird Susan story. So I guess like back in January, I was doing some ozone therapy, like RHP, where they take your blood all out and they ozonate it and I, put it back I, in. I just did that myself too. Yeah. It's awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I go in and she's taking my pulse and it's like my resting pulse is like 61. And I'm like, no, that is not good. So I spent 90 days deepening my meditation changing up my supplements, changing up my diet, going off ketosis. I'm about to go back in, yeah. getting my heart resting heart rate down to the 40s. And she's like, you're almost 50. It doesn't need to be that low. And I'm like, yeah, it does. <laughs> right? Because, and and I, get, I get that. And, and I love the server analogy because, you know, you can have a crappy server and you can put like a brand new GPU card in it, but this thing is going to keep throttling and then, you know, it's not going to work anyway. That's if, if, if you're watching or listening, this is just weird tech speak. So let me, let me get us back on track. You were, I, I, I just, followed everything. I, I love it. You're speaking my language. Yeah. We could talk about, we could talk about um, deep learning and um, cloud processing and, you know, all sorts of edge processing. We, maybe we will we'll see where we go. I was reading a Rob Report article about you yesterday. Oh, it just came out on Sunday. So you're yep. up to speed. I am. Um, I, well, Harvey McKay is my personal mentor. So he's written seven New York Times bestsellers. Harvey sleeps four hours a night. So he's in the same, he's almost 90. So he's, he's tracking with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You said, I don't think it's outrageous to believe I'll make it to 180 years old. And if I run out of energy, it'll just because I did too much cool. We're going to keep it G rated here. Crap for my own good. How do you, what are, if someone's listening and they've, you know, they've read your books, they've, they've watched, what is the recipe you intend to follow to get to 180? Well, I love that you call it a recipe because so many people are saying, what's the one thing you have to do? And there's an assumption there that it would be one thing. And if I was to say, all right, what's the one thing you have to do to make sure that your car is going to make it to 200,000 miles? You're like, uh, <laughs> I think you have to change the oil. I'm like, yeah, you forgot to change the tires. You didn't make it, right? So it is exactly what you said, a recipe. And the first step of the recipe is don't die. <laughs> so uh, that, you know, like, what does that mean? Duh. It turns out there's four things that kill the vast majority of people. And it turns out COVID isn't one of them. <laughs> it is cancer, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's hits women more than men. 
And it turns out if you have type two diabetes, which is metabolic dysfunction at its core, your risk for the other three goes up dramatically. So number one, don't get type two diabetes. And when I weighed 300 pounds and I had toxic mold poisoning and Lyme disease and heavy metal poisoning and all the other stuff that you're quite familiar with, I... Uh, was uh, diagnosed as pre-diabetic. And pre-diabetic is a medical term for, oh, you're actually type 2 diabetic. <laughs> In other words, if you're pre-diabetic, you're diabetic. Uh, at least that's the way I would view the things uh, today. So I went and I said, all right, how, how am I going to go in and uh, just edit my settings for all of that so that I can reverse what was, the, the in essence, being old when I was young? I was high risk of stroke and heart attack, pre-diabetic. I had arthritis in my knees since I was 14 and I was having cognitive dysfunction that scared the crap out of me to the point I bought disability insurance. All the lab tests, all the doctors, everything I had said, there was nothing wrong with me, but I knew very well something like didn't feel right, but it was nothing I could put my finger on. And you know, because you've dealt with Lyme and MS, uh, what I'm talking about here. And uh, when I, I look back and I look at, okay, how am I going to do this? Well, number one, don't die of those things. So get your metabolism working. And once you are, once your metabolism is working, it's really simple what that means. It means your body is efficient and effective at taking air plus food and turning them into electrons. The same electrons that power the data centers I used to design, the same electrons power your brain right? And either you're really good at taking electricity off the grid and getting into servers, or you take some of it and you basically discharge it into the floor or into your soda machine or whatever isn't driving your servers, right? So it's actually very quantitative in human. How good are your mitochondria? That's, uh, that's what we measure. And in fact, uh, at Upgrade Labs, uh, my company down in LA around hacking human biology, um, not at the cellular level, but you know, with the the restorative and the recovery techniques, they actually go in and use these big pieces of gear and all. Uh, we have uh, some, in fact, I would say the world's best way to determine your mitochondrial efficiency ratio. And the data shows 48% of people under age 40 have ineffective mitochondria. They're already inefficient. And so this is like a server that does half the computing it should do for the amount of electricity you put in. You might want to fix that. That will reverse your chances of dying of all four of the big killers. I call them the four killers. And from there, there's seven things you have to maintain in your body in order to live a long time. And I call those the seven pillars in Superhuman, which is my book about how to do that. I don't think in the course of this interview, we can go through all seven, but the thing is now we know what they are. Before, we just weren't sure why cells aged. And there are probably some other reasons, but these are the big ones. These are coming from you know David Sinclair, who's talking about the transport of electrons. Oh, now I can make electrons in my mitochondria. And my book, Superhuman, is about how do we make mitochondria? How do we use them in the brain? Sorry, not superhuman. That's headstrong. How do you use them in the brain? How do you make your brain work better? Because I had to do it for myself because my brain wasn't working well. And I turned it back on. Well, okay, then how do you get those electrons to move? Well, that's wiring. And that's what David Sinclair is talking about when he talks about nicotinamide riboside and all these things. So the recipe is, well, don't die from the four killers and then support the seven pillars of aging. It's all in superhuman. And there's a big problem that I think people listen to your show are going to pay attention to. There's a lot of stuff that crazy billionaires do. Uh, a, I'm not crazy. B, I'm not a billionaire. But I went and I did as much of that uh, as I could. So I did at Doser Medical Clinics uh, down in uh, Utah, I did the whole body six hand stem cell makeover where they pulled a half a liter of bone marrow out and uh, my stem cells and we injected them in every joint in my body, a four hour procedure with a Johns Hopkins neurosurgeon, um, reproductive organs, face, hair, like, like the full everything to be regenerated as close to Iron Man as I could get without needing an electromagnet. And I could have bought a really nice Tesla for that. But I think that's a better investment, right? So I did that. But then I'm like, okay, what are the reasons you do this? How can you turn on your stem cells without spending a nickel? So everything in the book is crazy level proof points that it does work with the most efficacy at essentially unlimited cost. There's maybe you're willing to spend 50 or 100 bucks and you can get some of these effects because the effects themselves are real, quantifiable, and known. And then what are the practices you do for free? that are supportive. They have a very high ROI because they're free. The problem is the investment isn't in dollars for recovery. It's in energy and time. So 
the way I look at this, the way I would encourage everyone who's running a business who listens to this right now, your ROI is not in dollars for your health, for your life, for your performance. It's actually in energy. Because if you have a ton of money and you have no energy, it doesn't matter. And if you have a ton of energy and no dollars, you can turn the energy into dollars via many different pathways. And when you have some average of energy and dollars, you're saying, oh, then time is the big thing. No, time isn't the big thing because you can buy time by hiring people. <laughs> what the big thing is, it's ultimately your energy. So that's what you manage. And if you manage your energy, you can grow your business much better. And your ROI is how much energy did I put in to this recovery tech and or this anti-aging tech? And then how much did I get back? And if you got a positive return, it was worth it. And frankly, on your podcast too, today, people should be looking, what's the ROI on this podcast? Did I get more value versus the time I spent on it? And I'm going to ask you to apply the same metric that I do on my show. I've got you know, a couple hundred million downloads. It's a, you know, Bulletproof Radio is a sizable show. But if you look at 200 million people times an hour average per episode, it's 200 million hours. You know how many human lifetimes that is? I am not sure, but it's like hundreds, right? I, I did the math. As a guy who ago. works for me, who would know this like that. Yeah, he designed I, the number one math program in America. Oh, I, like, I love that. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew when we were on like 25 million or something, but I'm not going to do the math now. Anyway, it's enough that I'm a mass murderer if I put out a shitty show. Oh, sorry, I said a word I'm not supposed to say on your show. If I put out a bad show. Uh, so anyway, it's just like, are you making people's lives better with stuff? And your show does do that. But like people just have to start thinking about it. Is the, What's the ROI on my French fry? What's the ROI of my glass of wine? If you're going to drink the wine, make sure it's older than you. It's easy. Yeah. And it, it means it, drink less because it's more expensive. That's the real <laughs> thing there. It's not just drink expensive wine. And it comes from a good source. I, the, you know, the one thing I think people don't realize, like when they're hacking their body, like we all have a clock that's counting down. And I remember several years ago, I was studying telomeres and telomerase and the clock, right? And some of the simplest things to slow down the clock meditation, hydration, just walking and breathing, then you can add, you know, some six supplements, IVs. I've done, you know, like peptide stem cells. This place I go in Mexico, they kind of like take you apart and put you together again. And a lot of, I had Dr. Paul Anderson, who's an MD, a bit of a brain biohacker guy on the show not that long ago. The, some of the most effective things are the most simple things. Yeah. I was listening to a show with Paul Check. I've been a fan of Paul like for oh, I love Paul. He's great. Yeah. And um, one of the things that, you know, Paul just gave some very salient quick tips. If someone's listening right now and they're like, Dave, in your humble opinion, what are three things I could do right now to extend my life? What would they be? Uh, number one would be to bathe in the blood of your enemies. There's nothing more relaxing than knowing that they're all dead. Okay. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Sun Susan, I'm, I'm the sorry. art of war. Is I'm totally that's kidding. The fifth, that's the fifth bestseller. This is where Dave takes Sun Tzu and he remakes it for modern era. <laughs> I'm actually a really peaceful guy, but um, one of the things that'll make you live longer, you wanted three or five, would you say? Is it three? If you want to do three? five, I don't, I don't you, know. You're the guest. One of them is humor. You got to have a sense of humor, right? And when you when you can learn to laugh at things that would otherwise make you cry, you will live longer. And it's a, about struggle. And uh, someone asked me on stage uh, a while back at a conference, um, Dave, what, what do you struggle with? And I said, I don't actually believe in struggle, right? I, I believe in failure, right? But you can fail without struggle. Struggle is self-imposed suffering. So if you can make yourself suffer less, if you say, you know what, I put everything I had into that and it didn't work, you can do that without struggling. You just pushed it all in because struggle is wasted effort. That's that 30% of your CPU that didn't get used when you were doing your transaction processing. It's called overhead. And if you can reduce the struggle in your life, every bit of struggle you reduce is energy that goes back into doing what you want to do and being who you want to be. Uh, and humor is a massive gateway to do that. In that same, if I can sort of, well, one answer with three parts. The other part that's related to humor is gratitude. And if you can turn gratitude on, it does magic. And this is something that I've, I would say at this point, proven quantitatively at my neuroscience company, 40 years of Zen. We have CEOs come through. It's a five day program, about 10 hours a day. You're wired into stuff and we put you in advanced meditation states where we teach you to get there. And then you go through a process that we've developed that lets you go through and practice gratitude quantitatively. 
So, so you can say, oh, I'm grateful for that. Like, no, you're not. I can see when your brain is grateful. You don't know how to do gratitude. You don't practice gratitude. You say you do gratitude. And when someone really knows the feeling of gratitude and its cousin, which is called forgiveness, you can start dropping grudges that you don't even know you hold. And when you do that, it's just free energy that comes back and stays with you for the rest of your life. So humor, gratitude, forgiveness would be massive things that change the needle. But people are probably looking for something a little bit more uh, tangible and less esoteric. So number one, don't sleep eight hours a night. Sleep whatever it takes to get yourself about an hour and a half to two hours of deep sleep and an hour and a half to two hours of dreams. And if you can do it in five hours, great. And if your body wants to bounce out of bed in five hours, don't feel guilty, celebrate and spend the extra time to start a company. Um, I slept less than five hours and usually four hours a night for almost two years when I was starting Bulletproof. I'm a VP with stock options at a big company traveling around the world while starting a company that's now a hundred million dollar-ish kind of company. And that's, uh, that's not something that's easy to do, except that I was managing my health like crazy, managing my energy like crazy, and I was working really hard, no doubt about it. But to be a father of two young kids and be able to do that, it comes down to um, that, that ability to manage your quality of sleep, not your not your duration of sleep. And I do everything there is. A lot of the original sleep hacking posts that have been you know, echoed around the internet are, you know, you go back to 2010, that was where they came from. Next up, you've just got to look at what you eat. Everyone eats way too much seed oil, what I call bad oils in the Bulletproof diet. And these are oils that go in and change the membranes in your body. Your membranes are what let your mitochondria turn food and air into energy. So if you build your membranes out of crap ingredients, you will have inflammation and you'll have poor ability to make electrons and you'll have less energy and you'll act like a jerk in your life because when you have less energy, you don't have what it takes in your brain to manage your emotional response to things. Someone's going to say something instead of going, oh, I think I'll laugh at that um, or at least I'll be quiet. You say what your first urge was because you didn't have the electrons to act like an adult, right? That's a big thing. And that's why you don't eat crappy oils. And if someone wants to feed you something fried in canola oil, it's not food. It just isn't. They want to give you an animal that's not grass fed. I'm sorry. When you feed corn and soy to animals, they become made out of corn oil. And corn oil is toxic for human cell membranes over time. And if you don't believe me, look at the, ins- the amount of corn and soy oil Americans eat versus, oh, I don't know, in China. You look at the amount of obesity in the US. Oh, we have seven times the obesity of China. And do we have seven times the death rate from this virus? It couldn't be correlated. No, it's got to be something else. It's correlated. So don't eat bad oils um, because it's really going to matter. And I'm talking about being more resilient, being higher performance, and being hard to kill. Those are kind of good things to do. Those are great um, things I, to do. Okay, here's the other one. And I think for your audience, this is going to be really important. Don't exercise so much, right? We have this mindset that's like, wow, I'm going to be a CEO and I'm going to go start three companies and I'm going to travel around the world. We're not doing that right now. Um, But I'm also going to stay up all night and I'm going to get down to 2% body fat and I'm going to run an Ironman. There's such a thing as overtraining. And because we're creatures of habit, we say, well, I'm just going to exercise every day. I exercised an hour and a half a day, six days a week for 18 months when I weighed 300 pounds. At the end of that, guess how much I weighed? 300 pounds, <laughs> still a size 46 inch waist. I was stronger, no doubt. But what happened? Well, I was eating the wrong stuff and I was overtraining. And what you wanna be able to do here is you wanna do high intensity interval training about three times a week. The data, which is in my book on mitochondria is very convincing. Walk for 20 minutes a day. Just move. Doesn't have to breathe hard. You don't have to carry pink weights in your hands or any of that kind of stuff. You can just walk around. And two, maybe three times a week for 10 minutes, do a few bursts of really hard stuff, like push ups until you can't, or run like a tiger's chasing you for all of 20 seconds and then lay on your back and pant. By the way, that's a John Gray, the lay on your back part. That was him who said laying down works better than walking when you're taking a break on an interval. And you, you just do that. It's not very hard. But if you're saying, I'm going to do an hour of exercise every single day, you're just overtraining. You're wasting your energy. You're not making yourself stronger. And I think it's really important to say that. It's all about the recovery. Yeah, 
That's beautiful. And I did that. I, I pushed and I pushed. And when I wrote the book, The Have It All Woman, it was part of that journey because I thought to have it all, I had to do it all. So, you know, I was pushing and pushing and pushing. And, you know, I always say in interviews, I gave myself MS, right? I gave it to myself. And, and now I think Jesse Itzler was on my show last year and Jesse was turning 50 and I'm like, dude, what are you going to do for 50? And he's like, I'm going to go learn 50 new things. And Jesse is like always pushing himself like ultra marathons. And, you know, I'm sure you know him, like it's always this push, push, push. But I think that especially now, as we look at hormones, we look at cortisol levels and we look at like how people are responding to this crisis. It isn't about pushing because that's just going to end up essentially putting someone into that state of massive amounts of inflammation, low brain function, not sleeping, you know, to your point. So yeah. I love, I love that. I want to ask you, what does your day look like? You know, like people look at you, okay, six companies. I just finished my fourth New York times bestseller. Well, it's going to be a New York times bestseller, right? Like it's obvious. I, I'm yeah. feeling very positive. It's a really powerful book. So. I have no doubt. <laughs> Comes out plus, in January. Plus kids, you know, wife, life. What, what does your day look like? Well, I live on an organic farm in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. Um, I actually, I don't think that counts as one of my companies, but Asprey Farms raises a very high-end grass-fed, ethically treated uh, lamb and pigs, and we feed our local community <laughs> with those. So that's part of what I do, but literally I'm looking out at Salt Spring Island and we're on about 30 acres. So I wake up, I look at my sleep score, that how did I do? I keep my phone in airplane mode when I wake up. I have two kids. Um, they're about 10 and uh, actually just turned 11. So 11 and 13 now. And uh, I spend time with them in the morning. My son usually comes out and uh, or comes out, comes into the bedroom and I'll do uh, Tai Chi and meditation with them. Uh, it's a really good you know, bonding time uh, for that kind of a thing. And then I'll make some bulletproof coffee. And yes, I do this. I'm not trying to plug it. It won't change my life. If anyone listening to the show drinks it or doesn't, it'll change theirs. So I do bulletproof coffee every morning. Sometimes I put the butter and the brain octane MCT oil in there. Sometimes I don't, but usually I do. And sometimes it's just a little bit. Sometimes it's a lot, depending on what I'm going to do for the day. Uh, and then I don't turn my phone on until you know we're done with our Tai Chi, we're done with our family, a little breakfast, even if I don't, in fact, I almost never have breakfast, but occasionally I will. Uh, and then I have a calendar. I don't do my own calendaring. And you know, people are like, Dave, you know, I want a meeting. I'm like, yeah, I know that we're good friends, but like, you got to set this up with my assistant because I don't know what I'm doing. And if I try and put something on there, that spot may or do spoken for. So I religiously have help and I set my priorities. My assistants know, hey, uh, let's see, what comes first? my recovery, my health. That is my top priority, right? And right after that comes family, right? And right after that comes work. It's really straightforward, right? And you can say, well, where do you build in, you know, community and, and friends and all that? They're on there as well. But in terms of the prioritization on the calendar, those are the things that matter most. And that means, well, when I used to drop my kids off at school back when, you know, school was a thing, um, I would. Uh, I can't talk about that. I know. I, I'm, I, I refuse to struggle and have stress. And, and that is the one thing I could think about that could be stressful. <laughs> uh, exactly. You know, it, it's, it's like if, if I was going to get stressed out, like, okay, you could look at politics, you could look at like national responses to uh, things where you look at the math, you're like, this response is not warranted. Um, but there's no point struggling and getting stressed about it. You're not going to change that. So you're like, okay, given the world that we're in right now, you know, sometimes it's rainy and stormy and sometimes it's not, and we're just going to move through it as best you can. And sometimes you get wet. Um, but uh, aside from that, it, it's back going back to the daily, what do I do? Um, you know, turn my phone on after that. And that's when I get, you know, text messages or whatever else. And then my day is set aside based on my priorities for what I want to do. Uh, I have liked to think I've finally, after making lots of mistakes, uh, become at least pretty good at, at hiring people and building teams. Uh, I, I still have room to grow there. Everyone always does. Um, but that's how you don't really run five companies. People who say that they do that are generally um, full of themselves. Um, what I do is I have five companies that I've started <laughs> and I have helped uh, and, I, and I guide and I'm chairman of, and I'm the spiritual force behind, uh, but I, I hire good people and I hire smart people and I empower them. 
And, and that's how I do it. So most of my day is spent and has been spent for years. I started this good sized company, Bulletproof. I lived on an island the whole time I did that. I raised $70 million in Silicon Valley from an island in Canada. You can do it. And I told them I'm not moving. And they're like, we don't care. You know, just get, get the job done. So um, that thing, that, that's what I do is, is most of the time it's, um, I do two podcast episodes a week. They're at least an hour. So I record those. Uh, and I work with my team on the different things that we want to create and build in the world. I'm opening a new upgrade labs uh, in Victoria, BC. My office is behind that and opening a new 40 years of Zen here, right? Where I was essentially right where I live, which is to, so I can do more with the local community and more experimenting on site. Uh, I'm opening a bulletproof cafe in downtown Victoria because I want to be able to eat that food myself. I, I would like to go to Santa Monica the way I used to. It's just hard to cross the border right now. So I'm opening one here. And yes, I'm doing it in the middle of the pandemic. Why? Because the pandemic will end <laughs> and I will have a great restaurant. And so will everyone around me. And I'm just doing that sort of thing. So it's all just about people. Uh, and I'm looking at my calendar for this week. Um, that's pretty much what it is. And I set aside time for writing and it's just about structuring process well and having people responsible for process, having people accountable and not wasting time. One of the things I believe if you look at what four minutes a day will buy you, if you can say four minutes every day, well, that's 24 hours over the course of a year. And that's three working days. So I am militant about not wasting minutes because it's dumb. Uh, and maybe the biggest innovation in the last couple of years I posted on Facebook, it's also a marital aid uh, and it's a second dishwasher. Okay, it costs about uh, whatever, $1,000 or something for a, a dishwasher and plus installation, whatever. Okay, that is the cost of what, four therapist trips? <laughs> okay, how many massages is that or what, whatever luxury spin you have? I will tell you that not having dishes stacked everywhere because you have enough room to put them in the dishwashers and you can just open the clean dishwasher, put it on the table and not put that stuff in there. It probably saves 15 minutes a day, a day. I get those minutes to read a book like to play with my kids, right? To be with my wife. So I look at stuff like that just relentlessly. Like how do I waste less time? If it's not doing something that I want to do, why am I doing it? You're, I love the, the process that you go through. Like every minute is sacred, right? Every minute has an ROI and it's yeah. a choice, right? It's, it's an absolute choice. Yeah. We um, at, at Radius, the startup that I'm the co-CEO of, it was so funny. So every week we're having these executive leadership team meetings and I'm sitting there doing the agenda and I'm like, why am I doing the agenda? And I was like, we're spending X number of dollars on data scientists, front end engineers, GUI engineers, like the whole list. I said, I'm hiring someone. And basically one of their only jobs is to chase all the executives around to do the agenda. So I save myself, I save myself, well, maybe like half an hour a week or 45 minutes a week. But I'm like, why would I do that? Because in every era of my life, I'm always trying to find optimum, right? Like we have, to your point about the second dishwasher. So our kids right now at home are 11, 14, 18. The 23 year old moved home. The 26 year old is not there. And it's like, they're constantly eating. I go in the yeah. kitchen. It's like, they're eating, they're eating. There's dishes, there's dishes and everything we can do to save time creates more quality time. And the other thing we're doing, like at six o'clock at night, I'm just spending family time. My phone's on airplane mode. I might check it once and then that's it. Life's too short. I, um, I wanna ask you, the, it's interesting because of technology. There's so many things I wanna ask you, but I'm deeply curious about this. McKinsey came out with a study last year and it said essentially 800 million people their jobs are gonna be displaced by AI and ML. If you're listening, you don't know what ML is, it's machine learning. By I'll tell you Merrill Lynch, because they're just gonna fire everyone, but okay. Possibly, <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, banker jokes, not tech jokes, yeah. wrong industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay, it's okay. I'll, I, I, could, I could just flow either way. I, we have weird office beams they send, it's, it's all good. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. My uh, undergrad degree was in computer information systems with a concentration in something called decision support systems. That's artificial intelligence. 
And we weren't allowed to call it AI because the professors at the time believed that the promise of AI had been broken so many times that it would be a curse to give us degrees with artificial intelligence <laughs> on them. <laughs> I disagreed respectfully or actually disrespectfully at the time. Uh, and now it's a thing. It is inevitable that humans will always save time. Do you know about the baking powder wars? No. Well, it turns out that the innovation of baking powder saved women two to three hours a day making bread. Wow. So in the, the dawn of the consumer packaged goods age, there were two product categories that defined every massive food company today. One of them was coffee because like, how do we differentiate this ground up black stuff that smells like coffee? And it turns out you can. And the other one was baking powder. And these companies went just massive marketing warfare to figure out who is going to give you the Clabber Girl uh, baking powder. Who is going to be able to do that? Because it was such an incredible thing. Now, it saved a ton of time. You go back even further. Another piece of technology that really wasn't fair was the blanket. Because some people didn't go to the trouble or know how to make blankets. Those people generally aren't our ancestors because they froze to death. And the ones who adopted blankets became our ancestors. The technology is technology. And that said, Bill Joy, the CTO of Sun before they got acquired by Oracle, a very storied guy, wrote a pretty big piece about the dangers of tech. Um, you can use technology for great evil. In fact, there are companies doing it right now. They're, for instance, banning certain content on the internet, uh, which opens them up to Communications Decency Act violations. All of you are going down who are practicing censorship. You have to do it all or none. So stop that already, big tech companies. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that is an application of artificial intelligence and machine learning. That said, we have an ethical and moral obligation to reduce human suffering. And that is the role of machine learning. And if the people in charge of machine learning use it for that, then they're good people. And if they use it for something else, then they're bad people. We're going in two directions. There's one certain country where the government does it all. <laughs> and gee, it, it looks pretty oppressive over there. There's another country where private companies do it all. And gee, it looks pretty much like propaganda land over there, right? They're both using artificial intelligence, not for the greater good. Is it a bad thing? No, it's no more a bad thing than a shovel where you can use a shovel to dig a hole or hit someone over the head. And what we're, not ta we're talking about here is not a technology problem. We're talking about an ethics problem. What will likely have to happen is either you apply the tools of machine learning and artificial intelligence to, well, to really subjugating your population so that they can't rise up the way they always have throughout history with pitchforks. Since we don't have pitchforks anymore, for most people, they'll probably throw their iPhone at you or something. But anyway, um, that's one direction. The other direction is we say, you know what, let's just have some universal basic income, right? And I believe that path creates a much better world, the kind of world that our tech overlords should like to live in. Because one of, you know, rampant suppression, Blade Runner, The Matrix, it's nice to write about that and think about it. But seriously, even tech billionaires have children and they'd like a world where their children will want to live and can live. Uh, so I like to think in the, that the inherent goodness of people will cause us to set the algorithmic outputs for our machine learning to be what we want. And you have to keep in mind too, Susan, our biology follows a core set of AI type algorithms. In fact, I'll tell you what they are. And I know this because I studied the biology after I studied machine learning and all that. Every life form does this. And this is you know, critical knowledge. It doesn't matter if you're a bacteria, it doesn't matter if you're a cactus or a zebra or a human or a piece of biofilm, whatever. It's number one, run away from, kill or hide from scary things. And you overweight that by 10. Because if you die right now, then you don't get another chance. Okay? This is uh, you know, a major thing. Number two, eat everything because famines will kill you over time. Okay? Number three, have sex with everything else. Why? Because otherwise the species won't propagate. So scary stuff is a 10, hunger is a five, sex is a three. Everything after that's a one in terms of waiting. 
Okay, the fourth F word, if we have fear, food, and fertility. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're afraid. You're afraid I was going to say something I'm not going to say. We're trying um, to not have the E rating after I this. I get it. I did yeah. it. <laughs> you did. The, the fourth, the fourth F word is uh, is friend, and this is why you have a herd of zebras, you have a cluster of trees, you have kombucha, where the bacteria and, and you have cooperation among things. Humans follow the same rules. We don't follow those rules because we chose to. We follow those rules because the ancient mitochondria inside our cells are bacteria that run a bacterial operating system. We have a quadrillion of these things embedded in our cells, sensing the environment, making real-time decisions, and then rolling them up through progressive layers of filtering, just like Splunk's architecture, if you're into systems management monitoring for distributed systems the way I am. And eventually, it hits the control system, your brain, and your prefrontal cortex has seven layers in it. And each layer basically makes a prediction about the future. And, it, and if what's happening around you matches what your body automatically thought would happen, then it throws it out, it doesn't even notice it. And you only notice what doesn't match the reality you're looking for. This is machine learning, except I just described the way human biology senses from a subcellular component all the way up to the brain. Well, maybe we can set our machine learning so it's not 10X rated for don't die to be like fearful. Because in fact, I gotta ask you this, Susan, is there anything you've ever done that you're ashamed of that isn't one of those first three F words? No, all procrastination, all mistreatment of other people. It's one of those three and it's usually the first F. That's why I started a neuroscience company to help me hack my own fear. That's the 40 years of Zen thing. And then food, you can turn off the cravings so you don't have, there's estimates about 15% of the thoughts that go through people's minds are about food. <laughs> What's for lunch? What's for lunch? What's for lunch? It's a huge waste of processing cycles. Don't do that. That's what Bulletproof's all about. Right. And then that third one, you know, our friend John Gray talks about that. I just interviewed him about it on the show. Um, you know, you, you probably don't want to be using a lot of porn and things like that. Right. And then how do you serve your community better? And if you can turn on that fourth friend thing and be of service in the mission of your company and your life, that puts you in a flow state. It makes everything else easier and you suffer less. So that's why you should do stuff for other people because it's good for you. And that's kind of how it all works. I love how you turned the AI into how we weight things. Right. Like, and, and people who Powers? aren't coding and listening, they're like, what the heck are they talking about? But it's making it so simple. So you're not like with Elon, who's like, we all have to leave and go to Mars because super AI is here and it's going to kill us all. You don't think that. <laughs> if, if we allow the people setting the rules for AI to put the survival of the AI as the first and highest priority, of course, it's going to kill everything. Maybe we shouldn't do that. I just don't think we will. And frankly, even if someone does do that, there'll be someone else who makes AI that does the opposite. Uh, that's why I coined the term biohacking because I'm very well aware that hackers created Linux because I was a cyberpunk in the 90s with my mirror shades and a leather size XXL jacket. <laughs> <laughs> like I know what hackers do and the reason Linux is a big thing is because Microsoft wouldn't release its source code and we didn't know what they were doing. So maybe we need biohackers because if you don't hack your brain, I promise you that the big tech companies will. They're already doing it. So knowing it's possible and then doing it yourself, it's your obligation if you want to show up in the world the way you can. Can you make mirror shades for your glasses? Because I oh, think- I totally could. Yes, please. Please. That's a good idea. I'm, t I'm so doing it. Our aviator style with the red lenses, yes. but mirrored on top. Those would be so yes. scary in bars at and night. And send yeah. them to Kara Swisher. Because every time Kara's on CNBC, she's wearing mirror shades. And I'm like, this is like the I greatest I will totally do that. I was just on Kara's show or she was on mine or both. Yeah, both. Um, how funny. Okay, I'm going to do she's that. She's such a badass. Like, I love, I love her, her. Yeah. yeah, I love her. I, my final question for you. There are people freaking out. You know, I, one of the things, the way I think is if someone's brain is off, I've always said this, if the body is toxic, the mind is toxic, the thoughts are toxic, the actions are toxic. If someone's brain is off, they're going to create bad AI, they're going to make bad decisions, they're going to spy on people, they're going to do all sorts of horrible things. There are people who are good people right now whose brains are off. They are freaking out. Their bodies are inflamed. They're listening to the show going, Dave, that sounds good for you. You're opening like 50 million new businesses and you're living this life. I am paralyzed with fear. What do you say to that person? 
when I weighed that 300 pounds, I, I would finish a meeting at work. I was at a company called Exodus Communications. Uh, we created the modern data center business, you know, Google's first servers. And those two guys in a server came to us and we, we helped them grow and Hotmail and all that kind of the Facebook and all. Um, but I'd be in a meeting and my brain was so toxic. I couldn't remember what happened in the meeting. And I would just write a oh, good thing. I took notes, but my notes would be like halfway through my pen was go blah. And I don't know what was going on in my brain. Then it was, it was quite toxic. And when you're that way, there's a feeling of impending doom and like you're walking through mud. Right. And what's happening when there's that kind of fear or, or even terror is your prefrontal cortex shuts down, your amygdala turns back on. And the easiest thing to do is breathe. And there's breathing exercises. And one of the easiest ones is a, it's called a box breath. And you breathe in for five seconds, 5.5 seconds if you want to be technically precise, but five is good. Hold your breath for 5.5 seconds, breathe out for 5.5 seconds, and then do it again. And if you just do that, for five or 10 minutes, it will actually increase the amount of oxygen in your brain. Not because you're breathing faster, but because you're breathing slower. And this is regularly done to calm the sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. That's the one that gets turned on with that 10X waiting and put you back into parasympathetic, which is rest and recovery. So you want to breathe. The second thing is, as is the topic of my next book, you really might want to consider either an intermittent fasting or a longer fast. And you're saying, what? I'm already stressed. You want me to not eat? Here's the deal. You're probably eating stuff that's making you feel this way. You don't know what it is, so don't eat anything for a little while. And if your brain turns back on, that's a clue. So you've got to get the things out that are the triggers, right? And you know, because you've had Lyme disease, I know because I had Lyme and toxic mold, uh, that there are some things in there. I, I can tell you right now, you feed me a few certain foods, I turn into a big a-hole. I, I really do. And it's not that I even have awareness of it. It's because the the machinery that runs my filtering system for the world, it requires energy. And when that energy goes into an inflammatory response instead of that, you get love handles, not just on your waist, but in your head, right? And your ability to perceive reality goes down, right? And then you will do and say things you don't want to do. And one of them is you'll freeze up, right? And quite often when you're in that fear state, you're also going to yell at your kids. You're going to yell at your boss. You're going to be reactive, um, you're going to have, like I did, I used to have the biggest muscles on my middle finger from driving <laughs> because I was angry all the time, right? That's not a natural state, but it's a biological state. It's not a moral state. It's not that you're a bad person, right? It's that your hardware is telling you there's a threat. I don't know what it is, but I, can, I don't feel like I'm thriving. Therefore, there must be something I have to kill or hide from. And if you're paralyzed by fear, your nervous system is telling you to hide. And if you're angry all the time, your nervous system is telling you to kill. But it's because there's a perceived threat and it might actually be real. But the perceived threat is probably not because you're watching the news, which is also bad for you, but it's because you're eating something that is, well, both food, but also a threat because it's the wrong food. Beautiful. Okay, I could ask you 50 million more questions. (laughs) But we're at the end of the show. You have your sleep challenge coming up. And I I'm going to participate in Girl oh, yeah. Guides Honor. Since I'm originally from Canada, we're Girl Guides in the United States. It's Girl Scouts. Um, tell us about that. Sure. I realize that there's things about sleep that are not known in normal sleep science circles because uh, the thing is I can get eight hours of sleep, even though the data is that people who sleep eight hours die more than people who sleep seven and a half hours. So it's not that you need less sleep. It's just that the quality is the thing, not the quantity. So I'm putting together a big sleep challenge. It's at daveasprey.com slash sleep dash challenge. And people can sign up for that. And every day for 14 days, I am delivering new information, stuff that people don't know about what you can do that day to sleep better. I've gotten one of the companies um, called Sleep Space to donate their monitoring app for the first month so people can actually track what's going on using only a phone. And you know, there's other sleep tech that, that will support, but you, you basically can have a free way to track your sleep. And I'm gonna teach you everything I know about getting better sleep, not just more sleep. And I'm actually really excited about it. We've got a lot of people signing up and there's also a private Facebook group and two Q&A sessions with me where we spend an hour where I answer questions with people live and you get to actually show your data, talk with others 
and we're going to tell you how to sleep, go to bed earlier, how to get up earlier or go to bed later and get up later, how to move your sleep and all the different things you can do. I truly believe that everyone who participates in the sleep challenge with me is going to walk away from this with permanently enhanced abilities to sleep better. That's my goal. Super human sleep. Can kids participate? Like, can my teenagers participate? Oh, it would be super good for teenagers. Yeah, there won't be anything okay. that's uh, that's naughty. <laughs> we'll keep it PG. PG thirteen. PG thirteen. Anyway. Yeah, my my kids will be participating. So. <laughs> Dave is always doing incredible things. So you can check it out at DaveAsprey.com. Follow him on Instagram. I think it's Dave.Asprey on Correct. Instagram. Yeah. And uh, Dave, uh, Dave Asprey on Twitter. Anyway, we'll put this in the show notes where to find Dave. But Dave, thanks so much for being here. You're uh, phenomenal. You... Oh, thanks. I appreciate the interview, Susan. Well, thank you. And Dave and I would love a five-star review. So if the show has been helpful, which we hope it has, please go ahead and share it on your social. Give us a five-star review. And uh, with that, we'll see you in a future episode. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another epic episode of the Susan Slot Project. For more tips, strategies, and ideas, visit www.susansly.com.